Hello everyone, this is Anna Rosinska. I am very grateful to Dr. Pellerito to have this opportunity to talk to you about domestic and care workers this week. I am very happy I can't talk to you at all. Uh, however, we regret we cannot uh, meet in. You have my picture here and I'm going to say a few words just to introduce myself to you. Um, so, I am a visiting scholar at the Department of Sociology, UMass Lowell. I also work for the University of Venice in Italy. And once my fellowship is over uh, here, uh, which means August this year, I will go to continue my research uh, in Venice. Uh, my first research on domestic workers actually was quite some time ago, it was in 2004, and while I am Polish, I studied sociology at the University of Warsaw. However, I also did uh, a study abroad program for one year in Italy, and it was in Naples, and that's where my first domestic workers study was located because I encountered there many Polish women who worked as housekeepers, uh, nannies, cleaners, or elderly caregivers. And I decided to uh, write my MA thesis about them. When I got back to Poland, I continue with the topic of domestic work, but I was very interested in what is the experience of Polish uh, domestic employers, and I included not only migrant workers who were Ukrainians in case of Poland, but I also included local Polish workers, uh, so people who weren't uh, weren't immigrants. Um, I defended my PhD thesis based on this research, and. Then I did some research for several years that was about transnational care in Polish families in the UK. And with this project that I'm doing right now, I am back on track with uh, research on domestic workers. And right now I'm focused on the American part of the study. And while I'm here, I have talked to many nannies, some babysitters, some cleaners, and elderly caregivers. Um, I also studied organizations uh, who fight for the rights of domestic workers, and uh, my presentation is based on my research here. Uh, you can go and visit my Facebook page that is about my research. I try to post uh, content that is relevant to what I study here. This week was supposed to be dedicated to domestic workers' rights and activism in general, but in the meantime, a public health crisis happened and uh, it impacts in many different ways the, the sector that I'm studying. So I decided to include this impact and the response of the organizations in, in our class on domestic and care workers. Um, I would like us to start by just noticing the very basic fact that not all workers can telecommute. So while we are told to stay at home, um, actually, this is not the case. Uh, this is not an option for many workers. And actually, it would be a disaster if all healthcare workers stayed at home, all farm workers, all grocery uh, shop workers stayed at home. And as Dr. Pellerito mentioned uh, last week, I believe, uh, using the very useful New York Times infographics, different jobs uh, also come with different levels of risks uh, under this coronavirus pandemic right now. So while it is probably the safest just to stay at home, uh, so people who can telecommute are the safest among those who actually have to go to work 
maybe farm workers uh, take less risks than, uh, say, retail workers who are more in touch with uh, people, with new people, with customers. Uh, however, healthcare workers are those who face uh, the biggest level of risk. And this is recently exacerbated by the fact uh, that there is the scarcity of medical supplies. So, for instance, we have we have heard about nurses in New York City who are forced to use trash bags as their protective gear because they don't have any other any other option. Um, and I'm mentioning all these jobs all these like work situations uh, just to situate better uh, domestic and care workers that I study. So first of all, uh, they are workers that cannot telecommute. Uh, all of their work is done in face-to-face -face contact or physically within the household space. So they the impact on them is like multifold. First of all, I would mention that going uh, going to work for them poses a threat to them. Um, first of all, many of them have to commute using public transportation, which as we know uh, is very risky right now. Uh, so if a cleaner visits say five houses, in a week, she has like 10 more uh, chances to contract the virus uh, on a public transportation. Uh, secondly, uh, they can contract the virus from people that they um, take care of, for instance, elderly caregivers or childcare workers, um, because the nature of the job is to stay in close contact sometimes in physical contact like when you give a bath or um, dress up an infant for instance so this is risky for themselves but also families and individuals are also afraid that a domestic worker can bring the virus to the household so on a mass level cleaners have their job cancelled and people like babysitters or nannies are also told uh, not to come, not to show up for work. In part, uh, in part of the cases it is because um, parents can now work from home and uh, can look after their children, but part of it is because of the fear that uh, the nanny could, uh, could infect the family. And some of the nannies have also heard that they can move in with the family, so become a living uh, nanny, which is not an option for many of them. But before we discuss uh, some of these impacts and responses to them in, in detail, I would like to very quickly situate uh, care work and domestic work uh, in uh, theory. So, first of all, um, well, theory, theories do not agree what care is, really, and there are many different care theories. Um, but just to give you like a very broad uh, definition, so people usually agree that care is a very diverse phenomenon that is composed not only of things that we can do uh, personally or directly or like in face-to-face -face contact, but it also entails something that is called emotional care. So, um, for instance, calling your friend and seeing how he or she is doing. And many forms of care can actually be performed at a distance and care can also be delegate, delegated and coordinated, and this is also considered a form of care. Um, these forms of care were specified and identified in the research of families that live at a distance. So this is especially 
uh, inclusive of forms of care that do not have to be performed in face-to-face -face contact. Um, and care in general includes uh, unpaid care, uh, which is done, for instance, within families, and care work, uh, which is a paid, uh, paid type of care. Uh, within care work, uh, scholars such as Mignon Duffy have identified uh, what they call nurturant and non-nurturant care, and nurturant would be connected with uh, physical closeness and things that we usually associate with, with the notion of care. Non-nurturant would be more about creating an environment that is safe, that is predictable, like a clean household, or uh, goes even beyond household, and let's say the education system can also be considered a form of care work that, like they say, builds and maintains human infrastructure in a more general way. And within this largely conceived care work, uh, we may notice that some of it is performed within the household and some of it has been delegated uh, to external institutions, like for instance, the educational process in wealthy families, say two, 300 years ago in Europe and in the US. Uh, mostly took place within households. There were house teachers um, who like sometimes lived with the families. Uh, however, right now most of the education uh, happens in schools and in uh, universities. Um, however, there is part of uh, care work that still happens within uh, households and this part of care work and this part of like care is done for pay by people who are called nannies, house cleaners, personal caregivers, babysitters and uh, similar people who perform similar jobs. I would like to point your attention to the fact that it is often said that uh, care work makes all other work possible and it is like a slogan used by organizations to reaffirm the importance of this of this sector. However, I think there is more to it and actually if we look at it in a larger perspective, uh, we come to the conclusion that care makes life possible because it is like behind all the social reproduction processes. Um, the next slide will be dedicated to uh, the specificity of care work as a sector and I would want us to see uh, care work that is household based as part of low wage work and what is called gloves of economy. This sector is especially prone to marginalization, the informality is widespread, and isolation of workers makes it um, makes it a very very challenging work environment for like workers' rights perspective. So if we think about an example of a nanny who works for just one family throughout the week and rarely encounters other nannies, uh, save for like um, meet meeting them on playgrounds or maybe when when they pick up kids from school um, it is a very very different situation than when workers in a factory see each other regularly in large numbers and uh, every day and they can like watch um, their interactions with the management and watch themselves perform their daily tasks um, also, what is particular for the sector is a very um, intimate 
relationship that often um, often starts between employees and employers because these people like visit um, on an everyday basis uh, the domestic sphere or like intimate household sphere of people enter their homes look after their loved ones and it's really very often that these people are referred to as part of the family uh, which is also quite problematic because uh, some some scholars say it's uh, it's a very uh, good entry point to uh, workers exploitation um, however this relationship is also quite different than in some other uh, work establishments and there's also specificity of like jobs within the domestic uh, sector so cleaners for instance usually come every week or every two weeks and are not like in a very daily contact with families whereas childcare workers who are more uh, nannies or part-time nannies they spend many hours throughout the week with with their charges and with their families and also personal caregivers spend a lot of time uh, with people they they take care of um, another very important feature of the sector is that worldwide we observe and also in the United States, we observe that people, that minorities, uh, whether they are like racial minorities or ethnic minorities, um, especially immigrants of color, immigrant women of color are overrepresented in care work, especially in what William Duffy calls non nurturant care work, that is, for instance, cleaning, that is um, less valued than nurture and care work. Despite all the odds that I mentioned, um, so the isolation, the informality of the sector, domestic workers have organized uh, for many years and have been very, very successful uh, and are actually right now inspiration to other uh, categories of workers. Um, in the US, one of the important things to know is that uh, African-American domestic workers have actually started the movement uh, in early 20th century. Uh, currently, migrants of color are the most prominent in activism. Um, and workers in domestic sector are very, very diverse, which also poses uh, certain challenges. Domestic workers' movement in the U.S. has actually a uh, quite rich and deep history going back to the end of 19th century. I have selected several events or initiatives that I consider to be American milestones. Uh, you can read more about them following the links and most of the links will connect you to this timeline uh, that is also part of, uh, of the homework of your assignment. And this timeline documents the history of domestic workers movement. Uh, and the idea behind this timeline is that it is supposed to be available for regular workers on their uh, mobile phones. So first thing I wanted to uh, mention was as early as 1881 in Atlanta, Georgia, there was a washerwoman strike that was led by black washerwomen. Um, the interesting thing is that they wanted higher rates for their labor and effectively they uh, almost uh, uniformly went on strike and deprived all the city of their services and they were successful. They, they achieved their goals. And what is also important along the way 
they recruited some white workers. Pro most probably these were Irish women who also worked as washerwomen. And it is one of the very important instances of interracial solidarity within the movement. Um, next milestone is actually maybe an anti-milestone because in 1938 a very important act was passed, Fair Labor Standards Act, that established first federal rules when it comes to minimum wage, rights to unionize and overtime pay. However, it explicitly excluded domestic workers, agricultural workers, retail workers, service workers and several other categories. So in the end, it effectively covered only around 20% of American labor force of the time. Um, it is very important, however, because changing these laws um, was one of the important goals for the movement to come. And um, it is often like a very important point of reference that very clearly documents the exclusion and marginalization of domestic workers. So the next milestone is a very large, uh, actually like a movement or a period of very active, um, uh, very active role of black domestic workers organizing um, who, among other things, um, established uh, the National Domestic Workers Union of America in early 70s. And one of the leaders of this uh, movement, of this initiative, was Dorothy Bolden. And um, she was herself a domestic worker. Uh, she started to work with her mother, uh, who also was a domestic worker, as early as at age of nine. Mm, and one of the, uh, like I mentioned, one of the challenges that uh, domestic workers organizing faces is the isolation of workers. And Dorothy Bolden actually used uh, buses to mobilize domestic workers. And uh, she uh, was meeting as many as several hundred of maids daily on the buses of Atlanta. And she was very successful at some point, uh, the organization that was like aspiring to be national, but actually was more local, uh, had as many as 13,000 uh, people who were somehow connected to them. Um, and the result of this whole period of activism is actually passing amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1974 that included domestic workers under, under these laws. The domestic workers movement's work was not done uh, and also the sector kept changing. And we have seen uh, waves of immigrant workers coming and joining the sector. Mm, and it presented like new set of challenges, especially uh, those connected with um, undocumented immigrants. And I would say there was like starting from early 2000s, there was like a new wave of domestic workers organizing that was principally led uh, by immigrant workers. And first initiative that I would like to mention is uh, establishing Domestic Workers United and on our, an organization that was mostly local. Um, but what was like very important, it was initiated by South Asian, including Filipina domestic workers um, in New York, but gradually it included 
uh, many uh, Caribbean and uh, Latina workers and so it was sort of like a new quality for the movement to mobilize and organize uh, immigrant workers on a large scale. A uh, second milestone uh, is, I would say, the first actual uh, domestic workers organization that is truly national. Uh, it's National Domestic Workers Alliance, established in 2007 by 13 organizations uh, from around the states. Uh, it continues to lead uh, the fight on uh, local and also federal level, and I will say more about it in a moment. Um, and among, among their achievements is inspiring um, Domestic Workers Bill of Rights being passed in New York in 2010, and also their recent initiative was uh, the National Domestic Workers Bill of Rights that was presented to Congress in July 2019. Uh, in the next slide, that might be a little bit loud, uh, you will uh, have uh, you will you will have an opportunity to uh, see what it's like to join a National Domestic Workers Alliance assembly. I went there in February this year and um, sometimes it looked more um, uh, like a party. <laughs> assembly gathered around 2,000 domestic workers from around the states and was simultaneously translated into eight languages and uh, it was very important for the organizers to um, put forward the interracial um, organizing and, and collaboration. National Domestic Workers Alliance has also a chapter called We Dream in Black that specifically focuses on Black domestic workers' um, experience and uh, heritage. Um, so this is a way of connecting earlier wave of organizing uh, from the earliest uh, initiatives from the end of 19th century until the 70s with the efforts of immigrant workers nowadays. Domestic workers activism in Massachusetts partly reflected what was happening at the federal level and partly showed how Massachusetts was also ahead of its time. And one good example of this last point is that uh, as early as in 1970, a bill was passed in Massachusetts that included domestic workers in state regulations that pertain to minimum wage, collective bargaining, and overtime pay. And it was four years before the amendment of um, uh, Federal Labor Standards Act. It was by the efforts of a very important Black organizer, Melnia Cass, who was active uh, since early 20s and who that important work, important community work in Roxbury. Herself, she was a domestic worker and she was also a daughter of a domestic worker. Um, this bill, while it was very, very important and was a big success of the movement, proved uh, after some time to be insufficient and to be also too complicated to implement 
in light of other laws that were being developed. So as, as I also mentioned, as new waves of domestic workers appeared, mostly immigrant workers, um, the situation needed to be addressed in a, in a new way. And since the 90s, we have seen especially Brazilian and Dominican workers and um, communities organizing in Massachusetts. And another very important organization uh, was Matahari, uh, that was actually a women's workers' center. So uh, workers' centers are very important for domestic workers because they make it a lot easier to organize for especially immigrant communities and they don't uh, it is like easier to establish a workers center than a union although technically in Massachusetts domestic workers are um, are allowed to establish unions to form unions um, so the three organizations that established something that was called Massachusetts Coalition of Domestic Workers in 2010 were Brazilian Women's Group that mostly mobilized Brazilian cleaners, Dominican Development Center that worked with Dominican uh, personal caregivers, and Matahari which principally works with nannies, but was established as an organization for gender justice uh, to fight for uh, women's rights in general. And as of today, they, they um, are composed of uh, nannies and au pairs and some other domestic workers that come from many, many countries. They don't have like an ethnic uh, focus or uh, yeah, they don't concentrate on a given group, um, but they work with all uh, like workers of all kinds of backgrounds. So these three organizations were the most important in 2010. They formed the steering committee of the Massachusetts Coalition of Domestic Workers. And it is very important also to know that this organization right from the start was very closely following the example of New York State, uh, where the first Domestic Workers Bill of Rights was passed. And after its success in 2010 exactly, they decided to also try to uh, pass Massachusetts Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, which actually happened in 2014. Well, at the federal level, the situation, the legal situation of domestic workers has been somewhat rectified by inclusion of domestic workers in amendment from 1974 in the Fair Labor Standards Act. And also after that, uh, inclusion of home care workers that were earlier excluded as providing only what was called companionship services. Uh, in 2015 to the same Fair Labor Standards Act, um, it is considered not enough because domestic work is a very particular sector and among other factors, the common informality of the sector is deemed to require targeted and comprehensive laws. That's why the solution that was implemented since 2010, uh, where state level domestic workers bill of rights, as I have mentioned already about New York state and Massachusetts in 2014. And so far, nine states uh, and two cities have, uh, have passed domestic workers bill of rights. And apart from New York state and Massachusetts, it is Oregon, California, Connecticut, Illinois, Hawaii, Nevada, and most recently, last year, New Mexico. Among the cities, it is Seattle and Philadelphia. What is very interesting is that these uh, bills 
uh, are very different. So if you think about, uh, let's say, a UMass Lowell student who works as a babysitter and works for three families throughout the week, and for one family, uh, this person works for three hours uh, once a week, for the second family, two days a week, every time spending around four hours, and for the third family, she works um, for another day, spending five hours altogether. Uh, she or he wouldn't be considered a domestic worker in Massachusetts because there is a cap of 16 hours for one employer that you have to work to be considered a domestic worker. So a babysitter like this wouldn't be wouldn't be like eligible for all the um, all the uh, benefits that domestic workers bill of rights in Massachusetts has. Um, but the situation, for instance, in Philadelphia is very different and there is no a cap on hours and starting from as little as one hour per one employer <laughs> the weekly, um, a worker can accrue paid sick time and it is called a portable benefit system. So as domestic workers' rights are being addressed in different ways at the state level, um, as I mentioned before, there is this important uh, initiative um, called uh, National Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights or Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights Act that was presented to Congress in July uh, 2019. Uh, by Senator Harris and Representative Jayapal that you can see in the picture here speaking to National Domestic Workers Alliance uh, members at the Assembly this year. And this is important uh, because even after amendments to the Federal Labor Standards Act, it turns out that while all domestic workers are currently covered by federal minimum wage, only most of them are covered by federal overtime protections. And this uh, specifically applies to live-in domestic workers who are not covered by the federal overtime protections. And one of the reasons behind this uh, National Domestic Workers Bill of Rights initiative is to include domestic workers in common workplace rights and protections and overtime pay is one of them, but also this law is comprehensive and includes safety and health, workplace harassment and discrimination. Currently, like many domestic workers are excluded from these protections and the bill extends uh, civil rights protections to domestic workers. And also another uh, reason behind this national initiative is to address uh, unique challenges of domestic work. So for instance, like I mentioned, um, the common informality of the sector makes it very difficult to um, assert domestic workers' rights. So under this new law, written agreements would be uh, created and distributed to ensure all parties understand uh, what's happening within the contract. And also um, another uh, important part of this initiative is to um, to address the fact that not many workers know about their rights, even if they are out there. The common informality, like I said, and also the fact that many workers are uh, immigrants who maybe don't speak English as their first language, 
um, makes it very, very important to include education as part of this effort. And um, this bill provides resources for education and outreach, um, including grants for community-based outreach and education for workers and employers alike. In what follows, I would like to discuss the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on domestic workers. As I mentioned, and as you can read in the slide, um, some workers are just laid off, their jobs are being cancelled. Here is the example of a cleaner, and obviously these people are sometimes, as we all know, uh, not protected by laws and are in a very vulnerable position. The problem is that domestic workers, you can think about, maybe you have a domestic worker in your family or a personal caregiver uh, or anybody who works in a hospital that is actually taking risks on an everyday basis. Um, in this case, uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance in LA Times discusses a case of a 60-year-old care worker with diabetes who is afraid um, about her own uh, health. She doesn't want to contract the virus and still is very dependent on um, the work that she's doing. So this is like a second challenge. And also, as I mentioned, many domestic workers commute to their jobs using public transportations. transportation. They don't own cars. So that is another risk factor for them. So far, uh, the organizations have been very active and has, have reacted very quickly to the crisis. And I have noticed first initiatives uh, as early as 12th of March. And what I find interesting about, uh, about the response of the organizations and the new initiatives is that they are multi-level, multi-channel and also multi-ethnic. So first of all, there are initiatives that are uh, focused on collecting information and making resources available. Uh, there are also micro-level initiatives that promote individual workers' rights and safety uh, among, uh, among workers who are not sure what they are entitled to under this crisis. There are also macro-level initiatives that address nationwide policies like uh, paid sick time. And first of all, uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance has a specific uh, website that is dedicated to uh, coronavirus resources and it provides information, basic information about the virus, but also has specific tips for um, jobs like nannies and house cleaners, and also um, provides a relief fund that I would Very important for many organizations is the fact that uh, all the information should take into account uh, their members who are not uh, English speakers, so uh, they make sure that the general resources are available uh, in other languages, not only in English. Um, for instance, in Massachusetts, there was support for um, non-English speakers uh, in Spanish uh, who were applying for unemployment, and also, for instance, Matahari an organization that I mentioned earlier, provided uh, training in English and Spanish. Um, 
I would want to show you a couple of screenshots from um, from Facebook Live that was organized by Mata Hari on March 19. Um, as workers experienced their jobs being cancelled, one of the important questions was, can my em employer tell me not to come to work and then not pay me? And actually, the answer to this question was um, yes, un unless your written contract specifies guaranteed hours that um, you will be paid for. Um, they also made sure that the participants um, who were undocumented workers uh, heard the message that they are also protected by us. And another important initiative that I have um, watched very closely was um, an initiative by an organization called Hand in Hand that works with domestic employers um, who organized um, an online event, uh, Best Practices for Domestic Employers. This event was organized on uh, Zoom and featured, uh, among others, uh, domestic employers who shared their um, best practices in this time, including, uh, for instance, uh, telling their workers not to come and paying, uh, and still paying the same amount of money. Um, and domestic employers were encouraged to do this as long as they can, and also um, discuss with domestic workers um, how long are they able to do this? Even if they are not required by law to do this, they were encouraged to support workers in this way. Uh, an in, in interesting part of the uh, of the Zoom um, was that it had on also specific um, tips for employers of cleaners, of elderly caregivers, as nannies. Uh, in case of every job that was discussed, health and safety was a very, very important feature uh, of the training. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the National Domestic Workers Alliance initiative was to collect funds, but this also happens at the state level and um, for instance, uh, Matahari is like promoting a Massachusetts Workers Fund and also a Docu Fund that specifically um, wants to protect uh, undocumented uh, migrants. At the macro level, uh, very early, National Domestic Workers Alliance um, was trying to push uh, the Congress to uh, implement uh, comprehensive uh, regulations that pertain to paid sick time and they organize the workers to like phone and mail Congress um, representatives uh, to promote this, this these laws. I already mentioned this amazing tool for domestic workers and organizers um, that collects information on the history uh, of the movement and I invite you as your homework to explore it further to go to the um, web page that hosts uh, this and you can follow uh, whatever seems interesting for you by using the search option. You can, for instance, look for racial categories or states or ethnicities um, or some other categories. I, for instance, put plague in the search and actually TL the two results if you're interested. And I want you to 
find an entry that you find interesting and uh, write a short summary of not more than 100 words and post it on a message board um, dedicated to this timeline by Friday, uh, April 3rd, uh, the end of the day. I also invite you to explore further resources and I highly recommend this report, uh, Home Economics, as a very comprehensive study of the situation of domestic workers in the United States. Mm, and also to watch the movie that is available on Netflix, uh, Roma by Alfonso Cuaron, uh, that won Oscar in 2019, uh, and that is about uh, indigenous Mexican um, housekeeper in early 70s in Mexico City. Thank you very much.